کے سر ویلکم ایوری ون گلیڈ یو کین بی وتھ اس اگین فار انادر سیشن انادر پروفاؤن سیشن ہیئر از ور ان دا کرسمس سیزن well we <clears throat> i just am so grateful for uh all of the questions that uh everyone has written in we always make that available and uh, i have to say this time i've got a, a just a beautiful stack of uh of questions that you've written in from your heart and uh that's it's always so beautiful because in the end even though the the ego is the questioning mechanism of of the mind that there's certain questions that the ego wants to keep out of awareness and when you ask certain questions it's like it opens your mind up um because you're starting to ponder and wonder who am i and that's a question that the ego has tried to convince you very strongly with that that the answer is that you're a body in a world of separation and don't you don't need to raise any other questions <laughs> it's like just stick with my answer here and uh you know you'll be fine just you know you'll you'll struggle and suffer like everybody else but uh you'll be fine 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 as a body and and you do have to question what's going on in your consciousness and you have to look at some of your underlying assumptions of what you actually believe in including the beliefs actually even in time and space so it goes very very deep A Course of Miracles is like such a straight shot to knowing who you are. There are many wonderful pathways, but uh, there are really wonderful non-dual pathways uh, besides the Course, but the Course actually gives you the, the underpinnings of why you seem to be here, and it, it gives you the full picture to give you the motivation to question what's going on in your mind and and say maybe there's another way to look at this world maybe my perception is not so accurate maybe i maybe i'm looking through a darkened glass like it says in corinthians in the bible and maybe i need to clean the lens a lot before i'll start to find that consistent peace and happiness and i look around at all your faces this morning and here we are that's why we're here because we have a sincere devotion to question what's going on in our consciousness and not just accept everything that the ego has told us as a fact. Back in the 1990s, um, I had a group of students in the, in the mid-1990s and um, starting around 1993-94, some of them would read the course with me and we would sit around in groups at a house and for much of the day we would read the course and then they would ask me questions and uh and then basically jesus was saying that uh no one can be angry at a fact uh that's a, that's a line from a course of miracles no one can be angry at a fact so the students really came at me after that they said what is a fact what what could possibly be a fact I, i'm angry at all kinds of things are you telling me i'm completely del- delusional and i they said what is a fact if no one can be angry at a fact and i said well christ is a fact and and god is a fact <laughs> so no one can be angry at a fact you know you, if you if you knew the facts you would never get angry you would never experience anger if you knew the facts kind of like a mystery case uh just the facts ma'am just dragnet just the facts ma'am well jesus is giving us the facts that heaven is real eternity is all there is love is all there is god is real as real as as anything could ever be god is the creator of reality and christ and all that comes from god is real and everything else is is an illusion that's why jesus says at the beginning of his book he has an introduction and he summarizes the introduction he says 
This course could therefore be summarized by the following, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. If you wanted an equation to wake up, uh, that's your equation. Some of you like science, E equals MC squared. How about that one? Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. And then my friend, uh, I have a friend in China and Nasheen, and basically Nasheen, after I was over to China a few times, uh, he was the man who brought A Course in Miracles to China. He looked at me with his twinkly eyes and a big smile on his face, and he said, uh, actually, you've taken that introduction to A Course in Miracles, David, and you've so practically applied it in your teachings, in your daily living, with your community, with everyone around you, that he said, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, could be translated into, and you've done it, no people pleasing and no private thoughts. That's the day-to-day -day practical application of nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. And that's what some of you have written in. I mean, uh, I, I think I was looking, Portia, you were wondering about uh, the correction of errors, and, and then um, there was another uh, question that came in also, I think it was from, yeah, Lynn, that, Lynn Perry down in Sedona saying, you know, how can I get to the place of accepting all things exactly as they are, and how does that reconcile with let your no be no and your yes be yes? So we've got some really good topics to go into today. An another topic, is coming in is uh, Louise White wrote from Australia about her prayer was to give over all past and future roles that she's played in all of her relationships, whether they be little instant encounters, brief encounters, or long-term relationships. How do I really let go of, of these roles? And uh, Francois, you were talking about that uh, uh, the other day, yesterday, you were mentioning that about with your wife and, and children, and then you wrote in a beautiful, long uh, expression, which uh, Francis and I have had a chance to review. So we'll work our way towards that. That was a, a magnificent uh, expression, Francois. And so a lot of you are, are asking these questions like, um, wow. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That's a high bar. And of course it's a high bar. This is Jesus Christ. This is not some spiritual aspirant. This is not some uh, phony teacher. This is not some uh, wannabe like God uh, teacher preacher. This is like the way, the truth, and the life. And no wonder the bar is so high. You know, it's high for all of us uh, to walk in Jesus' shoes. And yet Jesus assures us. He says, he says uh, awe is, is an attitude, is an emotion that's it's completely uh, in line. It's, it's appropriate for God. Awe is a, an appropriate reaction to God. It's an appropriate emotion for being in the presence of your Creator. But Jesus goes on to say that it all is not an appropriate response to, to Him. He said, I'm like an elder brother. We are exactly the same. He's basically teaching us in the Course. He's, Jesus is saying, you and I are identical in every way except in time, because you still believe in time, and I don't. <laughs> so, isn't that wonderful? He's like saying, I'll take your hand here, I'll hold your hand. We are complete equals because we share the same identity. We're all the Christ. All of us are the Christ, but, but you still believe in time, so I'm going to give you some instructions how to undo and let go of this belief in linear time. And then the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, come together, and then you realize that you are the eternal Christ. The Alpha and the Omega are one. In the holy instant, which is the gateway to eternity, the Alpha and the Omega are one. All these teachings from the Bible suddenly start to make sense. 
Jesus wasn't some special guy that was different from all the rest. He, ha- he happens to be who we are. He's just basically teaching us there's only one of us, except you believe in time and I don't. So I'm trying to help you realize that time isn't real. And then when you do, you'll see that we're, we're the same Christ and we have the same creator, the same God. And don't even let the, the Christian language or the, the masculine pronouns, you know, all that stuff, God the Father and Holy Spirit, Him and all this and that. You know, Helen Schuckman scribed the course and it came pretty much almost like a, as a correction to the errors of historical Christianity uh, with penance and suffering and sacrifice and so on and so forth. But Jesus used the same language to focus on the content. Like, here, let's get the content right, which is love, and don't get distracted by the, by the masculine pronouns. And at one point, Jesus dictated the song of prayer to Helen Schuckman, and all of a sudden, he started using she and her, and he flipped over completely in the song of prayer and started using all the feminine pronouns, like... Uh, and, and just in case you think I, I'm, uh, I'm leaning for one, favoring one over the other, here, and he threw it in there, but because the love is content. Love is not male or female or masculine or feminine. And even the attributes of love aren't even masculine or feminine. You know, this is a bunch of hogwash, actually, but you can't really see it as hogwash until you get to the state of mind where you start to see everything's the same where you start to see the forgiven world is just a world of non-judgment. And, and I actually have to say, unfortunately, male and female and masculine and feminine are judgments too. They're just as much judgments as anything else because spirit is one. Spirit is pure light. It's, it's not male or female or masculine or feminine. So all these debates and arguments of whether the Holy Spirit's spirit is masculine or feminine, you know, it's just much to do about nothing, Shakespeare said it. it's just a bunch of um it's still a delay tactic to accepting yourself as the one so today francis and i francis is down in the studio in mexico and why don't we go down to mexico just so francis can say hi to everybody and uh you can some of you know her and some of you are gonna in for a big treat <laughs> hi everyone hi Hi, so lovely to be with you here, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just feel so uh, honored, first of all, because the topic of this weekend, you know, this forgiven world, and how this one topic just called all of us to be here, I don't know, I just feel like, wow, there is such a deep calling just to, just to join in the forgiven world, and um it's so funny, David, you started this session by saying, you know, any question, any questioning of the ego will just lead to a really deep and profound realization because I want to share a little bit of um, yesterday. I came across this article where JP was saying to me, Are you, I, I'm reading this article, you have to read it. And I said, what is it about? He said, it's... Um, about movie editing. I said, oh, no, I I don't think I want to learn about movie editing or read more about movie editing. It's from um, someone who is movie editor who probably did edit the movie for Francis Coppola, like back in the 70s, very experienced. But he said it's only 20 pages. Let's just read it. It's really good. So we, we got into it. And this guy, he learned film editing at school and he, he got into his career and he was editing this movie in the seventies, probably for Francis Coppola in the editing room. And he just started to feel there is some kind of weird synchronicities. For one thing, he just couldn't understand why the movie editing is very nonlinear, right? You, you cut from one scene to the next without any explanation. And somehow it just makes total sense to us. And it's not how the world and our life works. We always is continuous. But somehow for movie 
without any precedence, without anything. It just works, and it just total makes sense to the mind. He doesn't understand why. And then he he had this incident where he just like when he was editing that movie, he he noticed the actor always blink when he was about to make a cut, and he was like, "Why is that?" And he just went so deep into it, and he went on walks and think about it. And where does it lead? He realized. Listen to this. He realized through a series of synchronicities by holding this question in mind. He that led to him to the answer. The answer is he realized that the eyes are projectors, and the images are projections of thoughts. That's why in movies you can just. From one thoughts to the next thoughts to the next thoughts, because that's how the mind works. It's not a linear. And why the peop- the one particular movie that he noticed the actor blinks is because it's always at the end of the thought. Then you, the eyes blink, and that's where he wants to cut. So he was like, "That's the questioning of a curiosity that leads him to crack the whole matrix, <laughs> leads him to see." This world is not what we think. The images, our projections, our our thoughts, and through his his professions, he see more and more. Like when people are in fights or in conflicts, they blink a lot because they're conflicting thoughts, multiple thoughts that they're processing, and and that is basically his his book is all about. And then when I'm reading it, I was like, how interesting that how. How fragile is this lie that this this ego put up? That even someone just by、uh, curious about something and they just really zoom into it and they crack through the code and see. So, and I I do want to say that if if we really can get that, like this world is just images that we project through. You know, through the mind, then that that is where the course is based on. You know, that's really where that's why nothing real can be threatened. That's why you know nothing can hurt us because all these images are really purely just projection of thoughts. So in that way, this whole world is a. Giant cry for love because this whole world of images is a giant projection of thoughts that are not from、um, the source. The, the, the thought that is believed that is, you know, disconnected from the source from love, and the thought is you can consider this cloud of thoughts that generated from this. Absence from love as a huge cry for love, and project this whole whole world as nothing but a cry for love. That's that's really what this world of image is. This is probably a good way to look at this world. And、um, so, yeah. So I just want to share this as as the start of this final session and. And、uh, I feel this foundation is really good for us to move forward, remembering that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's. I think if you're really working with the course, and you're working with a thought system that's calling you to go through a complete purification process, and it also is telling you about the destination, which is a state of mind. It's not saying this will. This will improve your worldly life. It's not saying that this will、uh, shorten the number of future lives you have to have, or even to have a future life.、Uh, you know, I know in in Gary Renard's books, he's talking about past lives and future lives. Jesus doesn't really even go into that in the course. He has a section later in the text called the immediacy of salvation, and. He's telling you, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your your just reward. For you have cause for freedom now. Jesus isn't even going into past lives and future lives. He's just saying, come with me and zoom into the holy instant and save yourself thousands of years, these illusory years of 
of trial and suffering and and playing out the same error over and over. He says history would not even exist if you didn't make the same mistake in the present. Doesn't that make you curious about the present moment? If Jesus says history would not even exist if you didn't make the same mistake in the present, it wouldn't exist in belief. It doesn't really exist at all, but it wouldn't even seem to exist if you if you didn't quit, keep choosing the wrong mind, if you didn't keep choosing the ego and clinging to the ego. So a lot of people I know, and I've met in the last 33 years with the Course, you know, when I mentioned Course in Miracles, they're like, oh, gosh, stay away from that book, and and that book is dangerous, and all this, and all. The only reason I think they say that it's dangerous is because they're so frightened of eternal love. They're really afraid of salvation. They're afraid of redemption. Uh, you know, you ever wonder with Christians who talk all the time about salvation, you got to be saved, you got to be saved by Jesus and the, the blood of Jesus, and then, and then they go in other parts of their life, they're terrified. Or they, they start commanding people, you, you better behave, you better believe in God, you, you, I command you. You know, when I came to the Course... I, I read this line in A Course in Miracles, and it said, uh, the Holy Spirit never commands and never demands. And I thought, wow. And Jesus was just bringing a clarity to this soft, gentle, loving presence. The comforter, Jesus said. Yeah, and that makes sense that a comforter would never command or demand. It would be this gentle, loving presence. I love you. I'll instruct you. I'll give you instructions. I'm not going to command you and demand you. I'm going to instruct you very softly. Just follow my instructions and, and feel that love coming into your awareness stronger and stronger. Even the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, you know, it still had a bit of a harshness. I give you Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not. It was a lot of what you shouldn't do. And... You can imagine how the, the, the human beings are frightened, like, uh-oh, God is commanding me, and if I can't live up to these Ten Commandments, uh, it's going to be bad news for me. <laughs> I'm not going to know God. But the Holy Spirit never commands, never demands. And yet, let me say this. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. You don't get any brownie points for 95%. You don't get any perks for 98%. You, in the end, what does that even mean? This course will be believed entirely or not at all. It means that you can't compromise. And in the end, there is no compromise between everything and nothing. Everything being spirit and nothing being time and space. You don't, there aren't really degrees between everything and nothing. You know, imagine going to a spiritual teacher and, you know, you talk and you share and I've done all these good deeds and all these wonderful things and I've been doing this, sharing the love and light for all these years and and I'm, I'm you know, I'm about, and the, and the teacher goes, yes, my child, you are 95% of everything. You know, it, what does that even mean? Nine, 95%? You know, what's that? You're either everything or you're nothing, and and people don't like that. But actually, doesn't that doesn't that intuitively make sense that you can't be eternal and be bound by time and space? Now, atonement works at all the seeming levels, so it doesn't matter where you seem to be, what you seem to be doing you can still shine the light and the spirit can use any situation that you perceive yourself in by shining this love and light. And eventually it will shine away the barriers that seem to be different situations and different people and different places that'll all get washed away. But basically what's important with this is it's very, very uncompromising in the sense that you have to practice this without exceptions. You, you really have to, as best you can, practice the teachings without exceptions, because any exceptions you make are going to bring about this compromise between everything and nothing. It will, it will still leave you partially happy, which is really an oxymoron. 
it will leave you partially peaceful, which really is an oxymoron. These partial word and peace, happiness, love, joy, they don't really go together. You know, you can't, you can't say, well, God's partially loving. What does that even mean? You know, if God is love, how could you be partially loving? So, even with A Course in Miracles, you know, you can read a lot of things about it, and there seems to be lots of teachers of the Course, but in the end, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are really the teacher, and the only way that you really learn this Course, believe this Course entirely, is by accepting the atonement or the correction. I mean the whole correction for time and space, not some personal correction in your life, not some correction of a personal relationship, but I mean the correction for the whole thing. When I first came into the Course, uh, it was kind of funny because I was drawn uh, to a couple teachers um, at the time, and one of the teachers was an Indian man. He was a, formerly a Sikh, and uh, his name was Tara Singh, and he had such a, a, a dedication to uh, silence and stillness and presence. And uh, he had been a student uh, of Krishnamurti for years. And I'd say, as far as spiritual teachers goes, he had a pretty good context of things. And then when he came across the Course in Miracles, he was just struck with reverence. Like he had such a, a reverence for the Course. He, he even, he meant Helen Shuckman described, but, but the way he carried himself, had all this reverence. And one time Tara Singh uh, said something, and I was like trying to listen to what he was talking about and understand what he was meaning. And he had kind of in his Indian, Indian English accent, he was saying, no, nobody goes near a true teacher. Nobody goes near a true teacher. Jesus could hardly find 12, could hardly find 12. <laughs> And, and I was, I just was laughing so hard, could hardly find 12. And I thought, well, actually, it starts to remind me of this thing, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. Because today we're going to start to go into some deep topics about transfer of training. Um, Francois, you is beautiful. You asked your question uh, about you know, what about my wife uh, and my children, my clients and everything like this? It, and then you were writing today with a beautiful uh, lead-in. I, I, I hope I get a chance to read that or Francis and I can read a bit of that. But it was, there's, there's, you're getting down to the core question is, um, if I really go for this, do I have to let it all go? And yes, this is Jesus Christ calling us. He, it's like calling us out of the world. You know, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, I'm calling you out of the world. He's not really asking us to, to find a middle ground somewhere or find the middle way. He wants us to go into the miracle and then go from the miracle into consistent miracles. And then from consistent miracles, he wants us to go into the holy instant. And what's the holy instant? Well, he gives us a clue where he says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. Even the perception of the body, like Francis was just talking about in movies, it's, it's a projection of the error of the belief in the ego. And then your amazing experiences you had by the ocean that you were sharing, transcendent experiences, you, it was so right. You thought, I won't, the body will not long be maintained if I stay in this experience, then, you know, forget the ocean, forget the wife, forget the children, forget the clients, the business, forget the spiritual teachers. If I go merging in with this vastness, there's not going to be anything left. Uh, and you get that quality from, from a mystical experience. There's, it's, it's so expansive. And also, there's part of your mind that's going, just hold on there just a, a moment here, because... If you stay with this, you'll have to let go of everything else. So I'm glad that you raised that. And, and that's something that I think Francis and I will address your question today, as well as a lot of the other questions that were written in, because in the end, there is no compromise between everything and nothing. And 
I have to say that when I first got into the course, I had such huge experiences. I was off in the woods and and meditating. I mentioned doing eye gazing, open eyed eye gazing meditations, where I I had these revelatory experiences where the world disappeared completely and all it was was just a blazing light and not the light of this world, but just this light of love and wisdom. And and then when I started to just extend in my heart and feel this vastness extending, I actually had people start showing up in the parable of David that would say things to me like I would just be sitting there and they'd come up and they'd go, you're my teacher. And I would like look at them like, what? what? What's going on? And then I had to eventually see in the teacher's manual that that's part of the plan too, where there seem to be teachers and students who come together for, for teaching lear- learning opportunities to, to expand the mind or to open up to this beautiful, perfect love and light. But at the time, it was like I wasn't thinking about being a teacher or, and I wasn't thinking about having students. And yet it, it's almost like involuntary, the witnesses started coming up. And even with those early students, I'll call them, they would stay with me for a while, sometimes for weeks or months or even years. And then it would get always come down to this point that you're talking about, Francois. It would always come down to uh, they would start to have these huge experiences. And then they would walk through their house and look at the family photos on the wall. And it would have the same feeling that you had, Francois. They would think like, Oh no. It reminds me a little bit of the Matrix movie. Remember the very first Matrix movie? Some of you might have seen it where, you know, uh, Neo's in his, uh, he's not even Neo there. He, he's just, he's just a, a human being in his work stall, his little cubicle. And then he has one of those little flip phones and the phone rings and he answers the phone and it's Morpheus. And Morpheus basically tells him, you know, after Morpheus identifies it, is this Morpheus? Yes. Uh Uh-oh. Morpheus tells him, I can guide you, but you must do exactly what I say. What I say, stand up. What? Now? Do it slowly. And and the instructions begin with that phone call. And the fear level (laughs) starts to climb with a phone call. It's like if you got a call from Jesus and Jesus, you picked up your cell phone and then you answer it and it's like, hi, you know who I am? Jesus? Yeah, that's me. I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. Now? (laughs) I got to be at work in an hour. Call in. You're going to be, you're not going to be going to work today. We have have some instructions. (laughs) What? I could get fired. I know. Do exactly as I, you know, you can just imagine if Jesus started guiding you from this moment forward and taking you rapidly toward the kingdom of heaven, he would unwind you from family situations. He would unwind you from job situations. He would unwind you from eventually from being a Course in Miracles student. He'll take you past that. He'll unwind you from being a Course in Miracles teacher. He'll rip you way beyond that, because those are just concepts, and he knows who you really are is the Christ. It's like, it's huge. Now, the thing is, you have to really be willing to go with this, because it will be the dismantling of your perceptual world as you see it now, which is through the ego's lens. So for me, I mean, I was drawn to that. I I was back in the teacher's manual one time, and and it was talking about you know, sickness and healing and how it's healing accomplished. And basically, he, he was saying, you know, healing is accomplished, but you, when you see that, when you no longer see that the body is the decision maker. Okay, the body's not the decision maker. Well, that must mean the mind's the decision maker. Yes, yes. Well, wait a minute. If the mind's the decision maker, then... That means the body of David has never made a decision ever. He's like, yes, that's right. Now you're starting to get it. So that means all these decisions that I seem to have made as as a character in this dream world are not real. Yes, now you're getting the knack of it. 
Wow, that is, that's, that's mind blowing. So that means I've never made any wrong decisions or right decisions as a person. Yes, now you're getting the hang of it. That, that the mind is healed once you see that the body is not the decision maker, that really you're just choosing between the right mind and the wrong mind, and that's it. And when you cease choosing the wrong mind, when you cease to choose for the ego, bingo, you know you're the living Christ. That's it. It's so simple. I'm like, that's like, that's like amazingly simple. And he's saying, then you read on, you read on, what does this recognition cost you? He says, as you, as you read on in that section, how is healing accomplished in the Manual for Teachers? What does this recognition cost you? This recognition that, that decisions are of the mind and not of the body. It costs you the whole world you see. Okay, Jesus is not pulling any punches here. He's not sugarcoating anything. He's not trying to gloss over anything. He's like trying to give you the fast track to the kingdom of heaven. He's like saying, if you'll follow me and you really hear me, you know, he's in there, he's in our mind saying, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I know the ego is going to raise a fit. It's going to raise hell when I tell you this, but, but you reach heaven through a decision in your mind. Heaven is the decision I must make. And, and you need to start to realize the power of your mind and the power of that decision first before you go back into heaven. So that's what we're going to be talking about today because, you know, it's not, I mean, it would be one thing for me to, to tell you, Francois, and yeah, well, you know, this is the direction it's going in, but the Better than telling you in words the direction this is going in, it's better to say, if you met my, me or you came to live with me for a while, you would have an experience. You get to watch. If you went down there to Mexico and you followed Francis around for a couple weeks, you would go more into an experience because the living demonstration, an actual demonstration, is much more than a few words. A few words, you know, everybody's offering a few words here and there, advice, you know. You're a consultant, so consultants offer advice. Here's the advice. But I'll guarantee you with the Holy Spirit's advice, it's actually more than advice. It's that construction. Jesus is, and the Holy Spirit are coming from an actual state of mind. So these, these are not advice. These are actual instructions. They're still suggestions in the sense that Jesus and the Holy Spirit aren't going to force anything on, on our mind because that would just prove that we're helpless. If, if, if it had to be forced, we had to be force fed, then how does that empower me <laughs> to know that uh, I need a divine intervention to save the day, a hero from above to save me when actually I have the, he says in the course that, that I am the, the salvation of the world. The salvation of the world is, is me. And, and I had to figure that, what, is, what does he mean by me? Well, first he means me, the mind. You know, I have to come back and start to realize this mind is so powerful that if I can choose the ego, I must be able to choose an alternative to the ego as well. And it's there. It's truly there. So thank you so much because all of you are, are really with us today. And this is really important. You can tell... This is a very important topic, and, and even when some of my students in the early years would just say to me, they would just look and say, I, I just can't do it. I mean, that's, that's what uh, Neos does when, when Morpheus guides him out, uh, out of his cubicle, and he guides him down the hall, and he gets him out there, and then Morpheus says, you can use the scaffolding to get to the roof. And there's only two ways out of here. One is following what I'm telling you, and the other one is in their custody, the agents, you know. The ego's great waiting there, you know, for, for Neo Do. He goes there, he, he says, I didn't do anything. Why is this happening to me? You know, we all can relate to Neo. Why, why is this happening to me? And then he gets out on the ledge, and he gets 
out and he's right on the corner of the ledge and then he's he's so afraid he's like i can't do this and and his uh his cell phone his flip phone falls out of his hand and that's the symbol of breaking the connection with morpheus his teacher and and he next scene we see him he's in custody and he's being taken in taken by the agents to be interrogated and they're going to try to you know bug him and do all kinds of different things but for us we're very very much into the practical application of a course in miracles we're not we're not just saying that's a book you can study it for a little and mix and match and and mix it with all kinds of other things he said this course has everything that you need and he said you will believe this course entirely or not at all i take that very directly i take that as an instruction uh from jesus and the holy spirit that's how i took it and so i i gave my whole heart to the practical application of this book and francis you and i were talking a little while ago we just have a lot of amazing questions i think we should maybe we can start off with uh you can pick one there and because we can first address some of the questions that you've written in and then hopefully we'll have some time to open up to uh do some some live interactions here on the internet as well okay well i i have as seen uh, yesterday you have addressed quite a few but there is one from Len from Sedona. Um, that's a pretty short question, so I can probably start there. Just read her question. Hey, David, I have watched your "When Is Ending a Relationship Not an Attack" video so many times, and I feel and see how this is all my mind a lot of the time, but don't feel it all the time, though. What I'm confused about are my no's. I feel a peace and strength when I hear the statement, "Let your no's be no and your yes be yeah, be yes." Yeah. Let your yeah be yeah and no be no. But where I still get caught up is the allowance of letting everything just be as it is, as is my mind is just to be forgiven. But when do those no's and yes come in? I have expressed this with you before, but I still seem to get stuck in this loop. Love you, and I'm deeply grateful for you. Love, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> yeah,、mm. yeah. Thank you for for writing in this question. I I I think this is、um, a very very typical. Question: Once we get into the course and the spiritual practice, and and when it Reach the point the rubber meets the road, you know. When we apply in our daily lives, when is that we just actually be able to be authentic and to say yeah, to say no, and when is like okay, it's all my mind. I don't have to change anything. I just have to change my mind. Nothing needs to change, you know. But I, yeah, I think for myself, I want to say that I. I see myself sometimes use even that meta- metaphysical principles as a defense to to stop myself from actually being authentic, because、um, I had that that same experience when I was married and felt very very stuck in my marriage. But I actually tried to break up so many times and I couldn't do it. Then in the end, I got the course, and I thought, okay, all problem solved. It's not him. It's all me. It's all happening in my mind, and I'm just gonna change my mind, and I'm not gonna change anything. So, what I'm thinking is that this is ultimately true. This is the highest spiritual truth that it is all happening in mind, like what I was saying at the beginning. Every single thing in the world is is actually a projection of the of the mind of the thoughts, and、um, they're all just reflecting back the internal conflicts, the internal conflicts that I still remember deep down where I want to go and what I belong and what I am, and this peace and this love, and yet at the same time. 
I also believe something else. So there is like an intrinsic conflict that's just projected out, and then project out a world that I feel things are okay, but is not not optimal. It's not completely satisfying, but it's it's okay. And I shouldn't complain. I shouldn't want better. This is just I need to change my mind. And I think for me, in terms of practical application, it really, for me to reach that place authentically, a place where I can honestly say I know for a fact this is my mind, and I can rise above that thought that hurts me. And I can change it by giving what I perceive as lacking. You know, from from that per- original place to this place, it actually went through a lot of unwinding, and the unwinding seems to be、um, in the form in like changing situations or not changing, but accepting, surrendering to what needs to happen. But it's really not. Uh, unwinding in form, the form again is it's reflecting an unwinding in the mind. The mind started to reach a surrender moment, to say, "Okay, I, I really want an authentic experience. That this is all my mind, and I want to see that nothing is external, and things are exactly as they are because because it all projects from a place." Of separation, and yet I can still use that to bring my mind back to where it belongs, and I can still experience the love if I choose to give it a new purpose. So I did go through a lot of unwinding, and I would say that is a very, very important element、um, throughout this unwind unwinding process, and that element is. To be honest, of how I feel, and yesterday I think the day before, a lot of us here are sharing the experience of private exposing private thoughts. But I I would all put them into one category now. Looking back, they're all a a a process to go toward the true self. So to go toward this place of total. Total harmony inside, and we can never be in total harmony when we believe in ego because of who we are. So the only way to have peace, to have harmony from within, is to 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 be authentic, to consistently go back to this place of authenticity of what I want, and it seems. To involve a lot of exposing at the beginning, because there was just so many conflicts, conflicting thoughts in mind. There, there seems to be judgments. There seems to be things that, that just doesn't bring us peace. So the the exposing and the releasing of it is a mechanism to to gradually be able to release and to drop deeper to see what is true underneath that. And、um, no people pleasing is the same, you know. We still the problem is not people anymore. The problem is we still believe these people actually do not share the same desire of waking up, and we do not see these people as part of our minds. So inevitably, we see other people have their separate interests. They demand things that we cannot offer because we are on a spiritual path. We want to wake up, but they don't. They want, they want things we cannot offer or do not feel inspired to offer. This, this belief of who they are, is the reason for people pleasing, and, and it is not their problem. You know, you can see it is our miscom misperception of who people are, of who this. This big projection is so. In a way, it is not their call for love. It's always, always our own call for love. The call for love always exists in the mind. Like I said, the whole world is a gigantic call for love. People seem to have call for love, but 
ultimately, this is a call for love from my own mind because I don't see them truly. So when I people please, I already hold them in a position that they don't have. So in that way, to, to say no people pleasing is always just also trying to say, okay, I have a call for love because I believe they're different. Let me offer the, the answer to love. Let you answer the love of my own mind so that I can heal this call for love, so that I can bridge this gap. And then, you know, in this perceptual world, seeming this process, you see yourself become the carrier of this, this answer. You step out of the way because you don't know how to answer the call for love of your own mind, but you, you put yourself out there and the spirit will answer through you. But it inevitably is answering our own call for love. So, so I would say that's why it is important to, to not bypass, not bypass this, this, this important and very precious opportunity to get in touch with how we feel and what is true to us, because that is a, a pathway that we cannot bypass. It is like a pathway you can only go through that to find out who you truly are, through what you truly feel to reach who you truly are. So I would say let your yes be yes, let your no be no is so essential. It undoes this this tendency and this habit to hide, to compromise, to say this, I, I do not deserve everything. To say that these people, um, they, they don't love me. So, but, you know, I just changed my mind. I still hold the same belief. I'm a victim or this is not good enough. And that is a compromise. So let's don't, let's not bypass, but, but truly honor our own feelings and truly have this, give us the opportunity to, to find out. Because believe it or not, we are the one that needs to find out what is underneath all these feelings. And then we can say, honestly, reaching that point to say, okay, this is all images. And I can let all images be exactly what they are because I know I'm not these images and they cannot touch me. So that's, that's where, um, yeah, that's where it goes. So I don't know whether, um, David, you have anything more to... <laughs> That's beautiful. It, it, it actually, I, all these questions are tying in together because, uh, because it's true that while we're still having to make yeses and nos, as we seem to be like in a labyrinth or, or a, a giant kind of uh, matrix, we have to make decisions. It still seems like we're making personal decisions, but all we're doing is really tuning in to that prayer of Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. Like, if I believe the labyrinth's real, then it's, I'm not going to just be able to twinkle my nose or click my heels and say, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, because that's like trying to affirm love and light when you have an unconscious belief in death. Uh, it's like putting a sweet icing on a cake of mud. Imagine serving up a birthday cake and, you know, and people are like, oh, they look at the candles and the sweet icing and let me taste that. And, and then when they get their piece, it's mud underneath the icing. And that's the unconscious mind. You can't put affirmations over, uh, over this unconscious belief. It won't work. So. I think uh, Stephanie had written in too. It was kind of we watched that movie yesterday, and and uh, she said, "Well, you know that that was Hollywood, but it's not only an imagination of Hollywood. It is possible. Jesus lived that life two thousand years ago, and now in two thousand nineteen, I can join with you." And she was uh, Stephanie. You've listened to probably a lot of my uh, audios. So Stephanie's there, and one thing she's talking about is, since I've been doing this for so many years, I've been speaking publicly for so many years, like a talking mystic, that I describe all these encounters and things I've gone through over these many years, 
And uh, you referred to a few of them, uh, smiling and kissing soldiers in Colombia. I think that might have been Argentina. Joining with beggars, de delayed flights, broken water boiler, waiting at a train barrier in Argentina. You, you, you've been listening to all these parables. And that's why Jesus spoke in parables, because the truth is so far beyond anything in this world. And even forgiveness is so far beyond the personal interpretations of this world that that's why people will be able to listen to audios of mine and go, oh, that was a, a, an example or a demonstration. What happened to David in that parable, like our friend Spencer you know, the Bill Murray character, you know, went through a lot of things where he was faced with uh, kind of extreme circumstances and he was able to laugh. And that's the way my life's gone. And that's more the proof. That's more the experience of being able to be defenseless when it would seem to the ego like it's a dangerous situation or difficult. That's where the people pleasing would be most likely to come in. You know, is uh, one time I think um, I think Byron Katie was talking where somebody had come up to her and was literally pointing a gun at her, uh, and and she, after all these years of practicing the work and coming into a state of mind, could could be very very defenseless in the in the face of having a gun uh, pointed at her in that kind of situation because of the work that she's done, this inner work. So I think it's great that you raise that, Lynn, because the unwinding that Francis is talking about will involve letting go of every image that you hold of yourself in your mind. Krishnamurti was so good with that. He said, he said what is enlightenment? He said, it's, it's no such thing as a person getting enlightenment because what we call relationships in this world, he said, actually are just images relating to images. It's just, it's just an image of the self relating to another image of the self, and neither of the images are true. So you see a lot of the interpersonal work, trying to change people or work out personal issues, is, is just image making. It's, Jesus would say it's just idolatry. It's just... Uh, the mind making a bunch of images and then trying to just have these images work with each other. Or a movie that uh, I saw recently, uh, Marjorie Pride, Prime, and uh, basically it was in the end these holograms who replaced people who died as therapeutic uh, devices for them to heal their issues. So if someone dies, you get a, a hologram it's just like them that has to be programmed with some of the memories so you can continue on your dismantling. But in the end, all the main characters in the movie had died, so it was just uh, these holograms sitting around talking to each other, correcting each other, pointing out what they had done wrong, and no, that's not the way it happened. And it reminded me of how elderly people can, can just repeat the same stories and then try to correct each other. No, that's not what happened. This is what happened. You know, it's, it's all much ado about nothing. And Portia, um, Portia, you raised the question too, because that was a beautiful question about the, you were asking about the correction of error. Uh, you were reading chapter nine, the correction of error. And uh, it's a beautiful section because basically in that section, Jesus is saying, Never correct a brother, because your brother is always right. I know people who are course students who they get to chapter nine and they get, have Jesus telling them, "Never correct a brother. Your your brother is always right because your brother is the Christ, always right." You mean my brothers and sisters are always right? Yeah. And he's talking about the correction at the level of mind, not the correction of level of form. He says, your brother may be speaking insanely, but still that's not your responsibility to react and respond to the words. You're supposed to overlook the words with the Holy Spirit's help and overlook the mind. 
of your brother and sister. Because why? Because you believe they have a private mind with private thoughts. So Jesus is like, are you with me? Here's how you get back to heaven. Overlook the words, overlook the thoughts behind the words, and overlook the private mind that seems to hold those private thoughts. Whoa, is that an overlooking? And, and the Holy Spirit does that. The Holy Spirit sees the Christ mind, sees the light. He overlooks the defiled altar and, and sees only the light of the atonement. So he overlooks the words, the behaviors, the thoughts, the private minds, which are still not real. The ego is projected out there. And then, boom, come all the way to the Christ. So you're asking the question, how does the correction of error relate to no private thoughts? That's how it relates. That's how the Holy Spirit and Jesus help us see the innocence in ourselves by, by overlooking the error, by overlooking the projection of the ego. And is that, that, is, that is transcendent. That is so deep because... Most of the times, like you were raising your question, you know, you, you like to, like it said in Paul's epistle to James regarding the taming of the tongue, you see this goes so far beyond the taming of the tongue. You know, it's like w the tongue is your words and, and wanting to speak kind words instead of harsh, critical words. Um, it's what Seema, you were talking about, Seema was talking about how she just, she, with her mother, you know, she's there with her mother and things are going along. And then all of a sudden, it's like you start to get these critical thoughts of your mother. And then all of a sudden, you're holding it in, holding back. And then finally, you, you lash out. Uh, you lash out at your mother. And then you feel guilty. Uh, and, then the, and then you try to overcompensate. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I was not a kind thing. I shouldn't have said that. And da, da, da. You apologize. And then you try to overcompensate, you know, whether you say it or whether you just feel it. I'm, let me make it up to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be twice the daughter <laughs> that I should have been now. And then you feel pressure of <laughs> being twice the daughter because really you're, you're the Christ. You know, you're not, you're not a daughter at all. You're, you're the Christ. But you see how that relates to what you were saying about how do I break the cycle of feeling irritated and annoyed, getting more angry, bursting, you know, speaking, saying something or doing something that I, I that that's not kind at all, judging myself, then coming back around full circle and going through this same cycle. This Course in Miracles is the way to do it because we have to forgive in the mind. We have to learn how to overlook the error, overlook the behaviors, the thoughts, the private minds of our brothers and sisters because then we do the same for ourselves. We, we take the blame off of ourselves for memories of behaviors where we behaved badly. We take the blame off of the thoughts, oh, I was thinking this about so-and-so or self-critical thoughts. We go past that. And then we also go all the way past the idea that there are private minds, like Francis was saying, that, that why, why did we put the people out there in the first place? Their projections trying to get rid of the guilt that we have felt for believing we separated from God. And now instead of keeping this horrific belief and horror of separating from God, now we just, we take our guilt in little small doses, a little bit with this person, a little that one, a daily dose of guilt from this one, this one, that one, that one. Jesus is like, yeah, it's not going to work until you get back into the mind. So thank you both for those questions. Lynn and Portia, you know, those are, those really relate to what we talk about a lot about no private thoughts, no people pleasing in, in such a big way. Okay, Francis, what do you, what should we try next? <laughs> Well, I was just thinking maybe I can um, share an example that very, feels very similar to Seema's um, question because um, yeah, it just popped into my head right now because I, I feel like there seems to be tremendous amount of responsibility if we want to always figure out what to do. 
and how to do it right and what to do, like in terms of behaviors. And, and I just want to share an example to, to tell you how it happened for me and how simple that was. Because、uh, I had the almost identical pattern <laughs> with my mother. And、uh, there was one time, I think years ago, when I was、uh, bypassing China, I can't remember, it was doing something. I had a few days extra with her. And yeah, she was just on me about something, like pushing me to eat more, or I can't remember what it was, but it really pushed my button. And And I was praying because in my head I was like, okay, I am better. <laughs> I have practiced this for so long. Let me just try to calm down, even though inside it was just building up and ready to get exploded. And I was like, okay, let's just calm down and work through this and forgive. And I was praying and I'm praying. And then I heard just to surrender. So, So with, with the prayer in, a, in my head, I surrendered and how it happened was I just launched to her, at her, like of how you are controlling me, blah, 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 blah. And to the point that I felt so bad and I could not stop myself. And then normally the way I do that, she will get triggered and she will come back at me. How you dare to talk to me like this? You abandoned me. You this, your bad daughter. You this, this is. But she didn't. When I launched at her and I so wanted to stop and I couldn't, she suddenly started to tell me, it's okay. She just almost suddenly became this spirit. She just, it's okay. It's not going to hurt me. It's okay. And I couldn't believe that's what she, her reaction is. And the, the, the frustration just built up because I just could not stop myself and just went on and on. And then she just keeps saying, it's okay. I'm not hurt. It's okay. And I just was in tears of frustration of not able to stop and overwhelming love coming at me. And I was crying and crying. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was,、um, something so profound that I realized that she, she, my mother was the spirit and that I never knew it. I always thought she was my mother, but the, when the spirit was telling me, you surrender, I got this and I went for it and she just become the Holy Spirit there. And from that point on, I can tell you, I never see her the same again. She, she is never my mother from that point on anymore. Because that was also the moment I realized truly what heals is not this interpersonal solution. It's vision. Vision heals. And this vision of who she was was not done through my effort. It was given like boom, like that. And, And of course it is, if I can give anything credit, I would say because I remember to call Jesus in that moment. And Jesus said, you relax. I got this for you. So I just, you know, want to share this because when I read your question, I thought, wow, yes, yes, yes. I know how that feels and I know what the problem is. You know, one thing I always feel really touched by, by the course is that The course is you actually don't know what the problem is until you find the answer. So when you get the answer that the problem is solved, only at that point you realize what the problem is. So when I was trying to sort out any interpersonal problems, you know, thinking that's where the problem exists, in that moment I realized it was my vision. I did not have the true vision of who she was. And the moment I, that vision restored, no more problem and no more conflicts. And I just hold that so tight in my mind because I cannot afford to lose it because that's where, that's the safe line. You know, there's in that state, there is absolutely zero problems. So, so yeah, so I hope that can offer you some kind of, Um, hope and comfort that it, it can happen and it's through, through Jesus that, that that vision will be restored to us.
Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. It's, that's such a practical example of the power of the miracle. And some of you might remember too, there's a, a section in the course in the text called Setting the Goal. And um, in that section, Jesus is saying, you know, it's like, I mean, the goal is really holistic perception, is to see the world as a whole. Because if our mind is whole and complete, the quantum field is whole and complete. If, if that's actually what's right here available to us right now, then the only problem we have is if we try to remove the problem from what we're perceiving and we try to take it elsewhere to be solved later on, you know, some other time. Like, for example, if I, if I give that example of right now, like right now you experience yourself as we're all joined here digitally online and we're here opening together. We're here listening to the witnesses. We're listening to these ideas. We're saying, show me spirit, show me, show me the truth. This is what I want. And then if you think of this online retreat right now and how wonderful this is, and then you, you may get this ego on the side, in the side in your mind saying, yeah, when the retreat's over, you still have to deal with this one, this person, that person, when you still have to deal with these financial issues or maybe these health issues or maybe this and this. You can see how the ego is just trying to draw your mind away from the, from the now into hypothetical situations that seem to be in the future or maybe even draws you back into the past like it's saying well it's yeah it all sounds good but remember that time when you were extremely fearful you know what about that what about this one what about this one from the past or what if what if what if for the future this whole healing is a healing of perception and starting to realize that that if you can just open to the miracle right now that this, it will radiate out and will literally dissolve away that past and that future. It will, it will change your whole perception of the world. And therefore, that torch of light in your mind, that, that miracle has the most impactful benefit because Jesus will rearrange time and space so that you can you just, as you stay with this purpose, you will see the world differently. Like Frances was saying, she never saw her mother the same way. She was not a mother anymore. You know, it's almost like they were just equally joined in light, in spirit. And, and she never saw her the same way that she had seen her before. I want to give you that appeal that that this is our life. We, do, we don't do this nine to five. This is our 24 seven, like we are in the moment, but it's like every single moment is de dedicated to this. And we want you just to give yourself the permission to join us in this, just like you pr gave yourself permission to, to join in, in this way, in any other way that we have available. And we make many, many ways available because it's our joy to extend it in so many ways and and we'll talk a little bit later but but those are the steps that you can take where you start to feel a swirl of joy in your mind and you say wow i think i want i would like to do this or this feels very supportive or this feels very helpful this feels very nurturing and then give yourself over to that even though the ego may saying uh you know that's not going to work. And it's, it's just a, like a broken record. It's a broken record of doubt thoughts that really don't have the power to stop you from anything. So I'm just so grateful that, uh, you know, we're here to be able to, to share in this way and that this can be something that, that you start now with, a, with that devotion and then you, you open your mind to the possibilities and you say, okay, Spirit, I know you're in there, and I know you're guiding me, and I want you to just make it obvious and show me what really will light me up. Let me follow my inspirations instead of my fears. Let me live life every day waking up saying, what do I feel inspired to offer to you, God? Let me offer you this whole day 
uh, this is your day. It's my gift to you. Uh, I'm not going to judge anything that occurs today. I would rather be inspired in you than and be picking away at these petty little judgments of, of people and places and things. We've got, um, I think, uh, let's see if we can come to another one here. I think there was one towards the back here that I was feeling. Oh yes, we have a new, someone who's brand new, Olette from Holland. And Olette is writing, Dear David, I'm so glad that you exist and I found you on YouTube a few weeks ago. Nice to see you now on the online retreat. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Beautiful. I write with Jesus for several years now and sometimes I hear his voice also during the day. But I sometimes doubt. So my question is how can I be really sure that the voice of Jesus is his voice and not a voice of the ego who pretends to be Jesus and wants me to be stuck in another mindfuck? I hope you can answer me. Thanks, with love. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, you know, in the Bible it said, you know, that there would be many Christ would, that would appear and false prophets. And and even there was a part where Jesus said in the Bible, you know, many will come to me uh, and call me Lord, Lord, and, and I will say, uh, depart from me, I know you not. Jesus is, never tells anyone really to depart, but what he, he was saying is he would say depart to the false, the false pretenders because you know, the Christ is the Christ. The Christ is eternal love. And if you're saying you're the Christ and yet you you aren't really acting Christ-like, <laughs> you know, loving and in the Beatitudes, then there's, he will say, depart from me, ego, is what he's really saying. So there are many, many Jesus channelers. And on the one hand, I would say, I encourage everybody to journal, to open up and say, Jesus, what what do you have to tell me? Um, Jesus, can you speak to me? Can you guide me? Show me signs and symbols that I need during the day. You know, that's all very, very helpful. And in terms of putting that label of, on the voice of Jesus, uh, it takes a lot of discernment. Uh, recently, uh, I've, the, there's some people that have been saying things like, um, uh, Jesus wants everyone to hear his voice. That's true. Uh, Jesus, if you, if you do this or do that, then you will be able to hear Jesus' voice as clearly as Helen Shuckman heard Jesus' voice. And, and Helen Shuckman's the scribe who took down A Course in Miracles. Well, first of all, Helen took it down over a period of seven years, but... She was writing the shorthand, and Jesus was giving her the dictations, but she had so much resistance to what Jesus was speaking in her mind that she would write other things than what Jesus said. And Jesus would have to say, for seven years, what I said was this, what you wrote was that, now go back. So that's why it took seven years. Anybody who thinks, you know, that they will just start channeling Jesus uh, like Helen Shuckman was, they don't even re realize how much resistance she had to scribing the Course. So Jesus does say in the Course that uh, it's very rare, very few, he says, will be able to hear the voice for God directly. So isn't it nice that he's like teaching us, it's almost like, for, he heard one voice. He heard the Holy Spirit, and he shared the Holy Spirit with everybody 2,000 years ago, so to speak, in, in that parable. And then it took 2,000 years before he could channel A Course in Miracles into this realm of time and space, because the ego fog is that thick. I mean, there's so much resistance to a voice that's, that's basically leading you to perfect love and light and leading you out of all illusions, that the ego is like it invented time and space. So it's ego always is laughing at Jesus going, well, uh, you're on my turf. It's a home game for me. 
You're the visitor. <laughs> I made this place. I run this place. I made all these people. I control everything in time and space. And Jesus is like, uh, well, you may think that, but I'm going to get through that thick fog uh, that you have made of mesmerism and hypnotism. And I'm going to reach through that to, to a mind that is willing to hear me and a, a mind that desires to hear me. If they really desire to hear me, I, they will hear me. So I would say, in answer to your question, because your, your question was really about how do I know which, if it's really Jesus, it's, it's basically what Francis was saying. We need to come to an authenticity and an honesty around how we feel. Because even if people are guided to be Jesus channelers, which is a beautiful contribution, actually, very helpful, it's still part of the mind's purification process. And the real question is not whether you can channel Jesus or not, or whether you hear Jesus' voice or not, but the one real question that could be helpful is, how do I feel? And then, honestly, you just start to work with your emotions as like your touchstone, your barometer in your mind. When you're feeling glee and happiness and joy, you know whether you hear a voice or not, you've made contact because you are in alignment. And whether there's words or not, you're just radiating that joy and happiness. And also, if you start to feel upset or irritated, annoyed, or angry, or any kind of emotions, fear, guilt, shame, then that's just an indicator that there's more unraveling, more undoing of the ego. But I'm glad you're bringing this up because a lot of times, um, I always adored Krishnamurti, and, and sometimes Krishnamurti would would just be looking around at everybody with his sparkly little twinkling eyes, and he would just say to everybody, don't be gullible. Don't be gullible. Like, don't just, don't just believe in everything. Go in, he say, find out for yourself. Go inside. Uh, he was such a sparkler because he was always throwing it back to the mind and always throwing it back to what's going on deep within. He was so humble that when he would be in front of a big crowd speaking he would be talking and spirits pouring through him and pouring through him and then he would stop like every 10 minutes and he would look around and he'd say are you with me are you with me you know you see he he wanted the connection he wanted like this is deep i know but follow along he said he said are you with me and then he'd say don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. Find out for yourself. Find out for yourself. He didn't even use, he didn't even call himself me. <laughs> he, called, <laughs> he called, he called, he called Krishnamurti the speaker. Don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. Find out for yourself with these twinkly happy eyes. I fell in love. I fell in love with truth. I fell in love with happiness. And when you fall in love with happiness, then when you read the Course, you know, you can feel it. It's there. It's, it's resonant. I could probably do seminars, too, on a lot of other teachings that are supposedly from Jesus. But I can, I can tell you from my own discernment, I can distinguish metaphysical differences. So the Course is, is pure. It's, it, it has, just like Jesus says, this course has everything that you need. You need not look beyond the course. So I'm not really big on course updates, course extension, the next version of the course. I've actually seen a lot of that in the last 33 years. And most of those things just fe go away like feathers and crumble in the dust because, because the experience is the most important thing. You feeling the happiness, you feeling the joy, that is your, uh, your discernment. That is showing you that, that this is Jesus speaking to you. So that's, I'm glad you raised that question, though, because that's a real good one for all of us. Thank you. Mm. Francis, what do you think? We've got about a half an hour. You want to address any more from uh, written in, or you want to open it up, or what are you feeling? I think 
we have addressed most of the the actual questions, and there are a lot of beautiful gratitude letters and prayers. So. Thank you so much for just putting it out there. It's just, it is most important just to, I don't know, to share, to extend. So yeah, very grateful for that. But yeah, maybe we can just open it up for the last half an hour. Okay, Nicholas, take it away. Anybody who has a question or comment, please raise your hand. Okay, we have um, Muna with her hand up. Go ahead, Muna. Oh, yes, hi. Thank you. Beautiful. Always oh, so wonderful to listen to you, guys. And uh, Francis, thank you for that example with your mother. It, it reminded me of a, a holy encounter of a different kind. I was meditating and then suddenly everything disappeared and... <clears throat> Spirit was pointing my attention to, to light, like pure dazzling light next to me. And I was so terrified, as I am terrified now to repeat it. But, uh, you know, Spirit kept, you know, had a, like a hand, a form pointing me to the light again. And, and, and I looked, and that was my mother in like pure dazzling light. And the, the beauty of that is I had the most excruciating a difficult relationship with my mother in this life. She was like one of the perpetrators, um, you know, in which my mind was stuck in this um, uh, storm of blame and, and uh, you did and you said and you didn't do and I didn't do. But uh, what is happening now for me in this retreat, it's been so, um, so intense, um, First yesterday is like I saw the sinner, uh, which need for me the healing uh, has always been about self forgiveness. You know, I could see that I'm blaming this and that and the other, but obviously, as you go deep with the course and you just surrender uh, and you unwind, uh, it was always about forgiving something for me, you know, forgiving me at some level, but I didn't know what it was. And yesterday, as I was looking at David and the shame was coming up of, you know, the sinner, um, which has been too abstract in my mind up to now, where yesterday I could see it so clearly. And I thought that was the end of it. And today I was still feeling so uncomfortable. Um, but right when you started, David, and you said who, who we are. This is all about who we are. It's always the question that stops everything in my mind. And I could see very clearly that I'm really at, still attached to being the shadow self. It's like it just never goes away. And I've done so much shadow work and I've done so much unwinding, but it's still there. And I could see now that almost four decades ago, I got a an invitation to release the shadow self, to release the Mona self, to release the character self, the personal self, you know, through a massive attack. It was like a chance for resurrection, but somehow attachment to the world and, and the shadow self and being a person and making it work in the world has been there all along until, until now, really, where I can see it so clearly that that is what needs to be forgiven. You know, that is the only forgiveness I need to do. It's like just release myself from the shadow self. It's like checkmating myself. And, of course, the mind can go in and says, well, how do I do that? But I'm not going to do that because it's all about handing it over. And, and so that's where I am now. And it's, it's really so profound. And thank you so much for, for the love, for the sharing, for everything. I'm so great. Thank you. Thank you, Muna. Thank you, yeah, thank you. And thank you for everything that you've just been hanging in with this and, and pouring your heart out and uh, in so many ways and being so sincere. And, and uh, it's reminding me, too, of something that Francois had written in, too, about, about not wanting really to hurt other people. It's like 
the, the deepest belief in our mind is this belief in sacrifice that somehow if we open up to our true self, to our real self, and open up to reality, it's going to involve a lot of hurt and it's going to involve a lot of loss. So it's, it's, when we hear it that way, it sounds absurd that to, to be who we truly are, we have to sacrifice our, our self in the world when, when the whole world was made up to, to block and sacrifice the oneness. So it's like this reverse amnesia, you know, the amnesia of believing in this world was sacrificing, which was, you know, blocking out our experience of of god and oneness and now all we're being asked to do is turn the tables on the ego and and we we don't talk about it as uh as ex- accepting our oneness because this the preliminary step is accepting our function we have a calling we have a purpose we use words like purpose and calling and function and that will make us exceedingly happy that will take us closer to that reverse amnesia to remembering who we are and so i feel like that's really our purpose now we share the same purpose of we're like cheerleaders for each other we we are here to inspire we're here here to bless we're here to not just to expose like francis said that's a preliminary thing is the exposing it's very important it can't be skipped over but we want to in this experience of what you say, like, is this lifetime, we want to get into the point of actually blessing and letting that blessing pour through us and experiencing the effects of letting the blessing move through us, through our mind. So thank you for for sharing that because, you know, I feel like we're all in this together and, and you know, I could really feel your determination. You know, you're just really hanging in there with this in the face of, of whatever and even if you say wow i i i didn't even face that that belief in sin that uh, the belief in the sinner like that i've never really faced it so directly it's a huge advance just to to face it you know that's a a big step and and it's there for all of us to to benefit from so thank you Thank you. We have Moon. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. We have Stephanie with her hand up. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. I felt when you, oops, when you say, "Oh yeah, Stephanie is uh, listening a lot," so it came like, "Okay, you are." too eager (laughs) so but I'm just so so excited Um, yeah I wanted actually to come back um, to um, when Francis or one participant was talking about the mother and uh, Francis you were telling how you perceive the problem so actually I was like when I write it was writing to the retreat here I always wanted to write about my daughter but I I couldn't it was like I started and then I deleted it because I wasn't sure what what should I ask what is my question actually for this and uh, um, because she's like you know, all her clothes are all over the place. She's not really like um, cleaning her stuff. And and when I ask for help, she's not helping. And um, it's very um, it's very absorbing. My yeah, it makes me tired. And then I was, of course, first I was like also getting very upset and talking loudly. And but I, I notice it's not the solution for it. So then I started to ignore it and doing it myself. And I noticed, oh, this, that's not the solution. And now for some time already, I was like, okay, we have to sit together and to discuss how do we, you know, really to, to listen to each other. And then, yeah, then you, but I didn't, but I didn't know how, you know, the, there was missing a link and I really didn't know the, 
yeah, I didn't know where the problem actually is. And then when you were saying, yeah, Jesus said to you, not surrender. And what heals is not the interpersonal solution. It is the vision who she is. <sighs> yeah. Uh, I really pray for, for guidance how to <laughs> what is the my way to to be with her in this oh, it's so beautiful thank you Stephanie it's like you're addressing that belief in sacrifice that somehow if you go on this beautiful journey that that again what about my daughter or what will become of of my daughter and and all what I keep telling everyone is like you know we take everyone with us in this journey this is this is not a, a solo journey or a, a journey where people are left behind it's like we we have to remember them aright, which is what you're saying, is that it's a vision. It's a vision of who they are that will bring joy to everything and everyone because it's real. And, and when we have that sacrifice belief that comes up, you're coming into that same answer and that same question that Francois was mentioning and that we've talked about over and over for many, many years is that when you accept the gift of healing, then everyone arises. The prisoners all escape the jail together. It's kind of a, a quantum escape. Uh, and sometimes people say, well, if Jesus escaped 2,000 years ago, why am I still here if, if we're the same one? But, but it has to be that experience of the light. Uh, not putting it on a timeline as if Jesus is a person who escaped and then there'll be other people, but starting to just realize that that you don't have to compromise. You know, you don't have to find a balance in the mom-daughter equation, you know, which sometimes seems like the solution, the interpersonal solution, like we should be able to talk it through and re be respectful and come to an agreement and oh, how the ego keeps telling us that we're going to be able to do that between people or between countries or between something in form. And then whenever I've gone in that place, Jesus has said, remember, I told you that this world is an impossible situation. I mean, why he's saying, why are you trying to solve an impossible situation if it's a jigsaw puzzle, why are you still looking for pieces to fit in the impossible situation? It, the real world, the forgiven world, is not like this world at all. There are no lights that, that light the streets at night. There are no stores where people buy things. He's, he even says it in the course. He, he describes this world, and then he says the real world, or the forgiven world, is not like it at all. So I, I think we're here to cheer each other on in our inward journey because we still oftentimes look to the world and we think, if I am in the forgiven world, in my forgiven world, my daughter picks up her, her stuff and, and she keeps a clean room in that house and she's orderly and she's respectful and she's cheerful. And in my happy dream, my daughter you know, is going to, is going to be a happy, uh, orderly, clean, respectful child. But we still, you see how it's so tempting to put it out onto the form, and, and it's just not, the surrender doesn't have to, it, it can't really go that way. It has to go in another direction. Yeah. Nicholas, why don't we try one more, and then I think, um, yeah, Francis has something to share, and uh, Greg yeah. has something to share here, too. Sounds great. Thank you, David. Um, we have Sedona with their hand up. Go ahead. 
He can go. Hi. Down. Hi. Can you hear her? I don't know. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hi. This is Barbara. Hi. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Get the camera here. I I just wanted to ask a question first and then share something. But uh, the question is, um, when I do my work in the morning and I'm talking to spirit, Holy Spirit, this overwhelming feeling comes over me. And that feeling is, you could call it joy, but it's almost a call for love because just tears will come so easily and I feel such a connection in my heart at that moment of um, this love that I, I feel is coming from spirit. And sometimes I will walk my meditation. And I, I was also looking for some of the things that I had to resolve in my mind. I would ask spirit and I would get an answer but not a voice, just an answer. Like it would come, you know, as soon as I asked something, it would just come to me quickly. And I was just wondering, am I answering myself? Or I think it is, I believe it's spirit. And the other thing is that everything that you are speaking of today about relationship is like, oh my gosh, it's exactly what I needed to hear because I have a partner also who we're not on the same page as far as like I'm studying the course and they may not be studying the course and uh, there is conflict. And then I, I just had to say this because some people are talking about it. I did surrender. I surrendered not trying to fix somebody or to change what they're doing. And all of a sudden, in that surrender, not that I expected this even to happen, this person started to do things that they never did before. And I, I realized that so much of the stuff that was going on between us had a lot to do with me more than it ever had to do with him. And when I took that into my myself, inside, into my heart, things really did change around that, you know, whatever. And I never had to ask for correct. I didn't have to correct anymore, which made me feel so much better. Um, and I walk around doing things that I never did before without any uh, resistance. And I'm so happy about that. But there is a, still a part of me that feels that call for love. And it, the call for love is not from the form anymore. I know that after listening today, my call for love is really from spirit and God. And that's my connection first now. And um, I could cry right now because that crying has to do with love, right? It, 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 the love of spirit coming to me. It's not like I'm sad. I'm joyful. I, I just wanted to share that. And thank you. Thank, uh, you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Barbara. That's such a beautiful witness because that's exactly, that is spirit. And that is just the way that it happens. It doesn't have to be a voice. You can just be, wow, you know, the answer just, instantly after you make the prayer that's a beautiful demonstration and and also what you were sharing about with you and your partner who doesn't study the course it it reminds me of uh dr hugh len uh, the, who was the the founder of ho'oponopono how uh he was a a therapist at a at a center in hawaii and he it was all kinds of turnover and it was ex extreme cases of people that have, have been psychotic, schizophrenic, and all kinds of personality disorders that the world calls it. And then he uh, basically was took over as to, to be the uh, a, a director there. And he was given uh, 
write-ups and pages of, of all their case histories and everything. And he, he just prayed over each one. He, he prayed and he really took it, uh, surrendered it over. And he never actually uh, had to meet with the people and do intakes or counseling or words or sessions. But he, through praying and giving this stack of, of past references of each case, of each person there, he cleared out the whole institute. And he basically, uh, that was such a powerful witness of just through the power of mind, not even through the power of using words and everything. He cleared out the whole institute. They had to close the, the place after he was through with it. So your, your witness, your sharing, Barbara, was just amazing because it's that simple, and it can and it can be that quick, and and it can be that easy too. We don't we don't want to buy into the ego thing that everything has to be a long, complicated process. Uh, when actually, it's it's the desire of your heart. God knows the the prayer of the heart uh, before even a word is spoken, and and you just were a great witness. Well, we've we've got about nine minutes left, and actually, we have we're so excited because Francis uh, and many many in our community have joined together to bring uh, this movie "Take Me Home" uh, and to go through the whole process of the shooting and the editing, and and now we're doing these weekend retreats, and and actually, Francis is going to take a little bit of time just to share that right after Christmas uh, we. We have uh, an, our first online event with this uh, Take Me Home movie because people from all over the world have been writing in saying, how can I see it? I live in a remote area and um, I want to see the movie. And, and it's not been produced and distributed typically like a movie. So, Francis, why don't you take yes. it away and then have a few words to share, too, from Camus. Okay. Thank you, David. And I, I want to lead into that with um, just a few sentences from Francois. Um, beautiful, amazing, beautiful description because um, I, I don't have time to read through. I really want it because your description of what you have experienced just touched me so deeply. You had a glimpse of this overwhelming love and oneness and the emotion that you felt. And then after that, the question is, you know, there's a fear of, of how to face your family. And, and then at the very end, your question is, is that even possible to, to, to actually do this with this forgiven state of mind with the people around you, like in the community? And I, I hear you, your question is that this, amazing forgiven state of mind is that is that possible to keep going forward without any compromise is that even practical is that just a glimpse of the end um and and that's it you know how do we move forward and i just remember that you know you said you read the course 18 times and uh i think this a deep call to say okay how do i do this in a really practical way. And Jesus actually, I remember he described the special relationships in this world. He used, I think the words he used are destructive, childish, and egotistic or egocentric. This, and, and then and yet in the same sentence, he said, and yet if, if that is given to the Holy Spirit, they become the holiest thing that can lead you back to God. So, yeah, so I, the reason that I want to address your question and combine what I'm about to say next is because, yes, the answer is a resounding yes. It is possible to not compromise in our relationships and not only that, but actually turn the relationships in such a way that it becomes a holy pathway back to that state of mind. Um, so what David was talking about, um, a movie called Take Me Home, is what we just produced and is a documentary movie about an hour and 20 minutes long. 
um, the movie was actually um, a, a shot over 30 days of one of our event that took place in Utah in our monastery. The event um, is called Tabula Rasa Mystery School. So basically, we we felt really guided to to actually do the movie, and there are just so many backstories around the, how we got the prompt to do it, why in that particular time, because I have waited for six years before I first got the dream to make it until the time was given. And, um, and it was shot over 30 days for people who came to the monastery for no other purpose but to use their relationships and to go so high to the forgiven state of mind and not compromising anything. It's a, a month that devoted to, to sharing, uh, devoted to authenticity, to trust, to guidance, and literally devoted to however it's going to be guided, however it's going to be looked. So the camera was set, and we had no idea what was going to unfold in front of the camera, if anything going to unfold, who and how. So it itself is also a work of trust, but right now the movie finished um, this year, and um, we are going to do the first online showing um, right after Christmas, the weekend after Christmas. Christmas, uh, I think it's December 20, 27th to 29th. We're going to do a whole weekend, um, starting Friday night, a whole day Saturday and Sunday morning, to bring this um, online showing to a place where it's not just to show the movie, but to answer that very question that you raised. Practically, you know, how is this possible? And how is it possible to actually function in a way that is so opposite from from this world, from the judgment of the ego, how to operate, how to hear guidance, and how to really use the relationship to come closer together. So I feel I actually really called myself to um, to not just show the movie, but just to be with you because I see this this time that we come together is a massive answer to the call for love that that to the mind that we share. And it's not anybody that can can bring the answer, and yet everybody can um, become a, ch- a channel to offer this this answer that Jesus Jesus wants to shower us with when we come together with this purpose. So I feel like um, when we got the guidance to to show the movie online, which we we were thinking of going to show it more in a physical gathering, but when we got the guidance to show it online, we just thought, you know, nothing is more appropriate, appropriate to do it during Christmas time, actually before the New Year, so that we we can really use that time not only just as a movie showing, but as a prayer, offering our deepest call for love to Jesus together and have him answer us in that weekend right there and then, and then we move forward together and not looking back. So um, I just I want to invite you to, to join with me and David and a lot of the casts on the movie. We're all going to be there. And please also write in your questions beforehand because we want, to, we want you to ask whatever questions you have on your mind. Uh, we have a whole weekend to really go into it. So that's um, that's what I want to share uh, before the end of this weekend. So, yeah. Okay, and Greg is with us right here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to be here again with you all. So, um, as you know, we have uh, so many online events. We have uh, so much extension happening uh, digitally, and that will continue and expand. Um, and we wanted to welcome you to uh, another um, event in 2020 to America. 
Uh, this will be the only um, in-person event that we have in the United States. It will be August 3rd through 9th. It's seven days long. And really, uh, the event itself, symbolic of non-compromising teachings, um, and as Francis is sharing, an authentic journey uh, for us who are committed to the event, it's it's fully fully used as an event uh, symbolic for healing and just continuing to uh, deepen deepen in our our trust and in, in, in our experience of of this path and the goal. So yeah, I just want to welcome you to that experience. Um, we it will be set in the uh, Living Miracles Monastery, the only Course in Miracles Monastery in the world. Uh, it's, there's a 150 foot drop into the canyon, into the Strawberry River Canyon in Utah, and it's symbolic of of the mind opening, uh, symbolic of silence, uh, a deepening of of our mind into a vastness. So we welcome you to come rest, um, and delight in in the purpose. Um, and yeah, so I do want to say that um, there's some private accommodations that will go very quickly. They're half gone. So um, if you wait too long, those uh, amazing private, if you really need to be inward and really need your own little space, beautiful space, then those will be limited. So the early bird special also goes on till January 31st. Uh, you can go to livingmiracles.org forward slash events and find all our events, including Awakening to Love Enlightenment Retreat 2020. So yeah, thank you for letting me share. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Mm. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And, and we just... I, I always really enjoy these uh, online retreats at the beginning of the month. And as Greg was saying, we have, we've got our centers and the digital is expanding. And so we just love beaming to you from wherever we seem to be and, and uh, wherever you seem to be and, and just feeling the connection. It just is a very uh, strong symbol of, of our oneness, that we're all the same one. And I just, you know, when I look at you, I, I see Katarina over there in Austria, and I look around, and there's Sema, Rochester, and a lot of the places, you know, we we do get a chance to to visit, but but more and more it seems like the digital is coming in. And so, as Greg said, uh, this will be our event here in, in Utah where we can come and, and actually hug you, even though the... There's, we have virtual hugs and we have actual hugs and that's an, another joy for us too. So, so thank you for participating and, and hope to see you uh, December 27th where we'll just have Francis and I and a whole group of us uh, and a movie, the movie that is like two and a half years uh, in the making. And uh, you'll get to see in the context of healing, we'll talk, with all your questions and, and all the interactions around uh, the movie and the cast. Uh, it'll be a, a thrill for us to have a Christmas joining with the cast of Take Me Home. So farewell for now. Love you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> um, look